Good afternoon. As we uh, arrived here this afternoon, we realized we had nobody who was going to formally introduce me. Um, not, um, not that I actually think I need to, but for those who don't know me, that's who I am. Um, Richard Flores, uh, Professor of Anthropology and Senior Associate Dean in the college. Uh, thank you all for coming. As uh, I saw the storm approaching on my telephone radar map, it's like, Texans and water don't mix. So uh, you guys are, are very brave. What I'd like to do today is present some ideas, um, actually some analysis and ideas, um, in a rather large frame. And I'm doing this both in a way that is um, analytical and hopefully uh, suggestive. So first of all, I will start out by talking about why I think education is in transition. Um, I will look at some of the symptoms of that transition and my premise, and you don't have to guess hard, but my premise is tied to the notion of globalization, which I will define in the matter of this presentation. Then I want to look at the effects of globalization on higher education. Uh, some of the responses I think that we have had and my own sort of take on those responses and a way forward. And I should say, um, especially those of you who are chairs in the, Depart in the College of Liberal Arts, these are ideas meant for dialogue. This is, uh, I'm not trying to institute radical change, um, although I think sometimes radical change is good. Um, but so this is what I want to walk you through this afternoon. So it says liberal education, but I should have just written education is in transition. And I suggest it's in transition, if not in crisis. And I say this not as an alarmist, but as someone who's interested in rethinking and revisioning um, intellectual practice overall. Now, what do I mean by liberal education? I take a rather large view of liberal education. Um, you have it there, knowledge that examines, understands, and connects the conditions of our making, our current reality, and our way of thinking about the future. It's a holistic approach to what we do, to the world. I also take it as a traditional arts and sciences education. And it's not synonymous necessarily with liberal arts colleges, but I do think liberal arts colleges serve as a barometer for some of the, um, the changes that are affecting education in general. So, so what are some of the symptoms of this transition? The first one I'll point to is the decline of liberal arts colleges. Most recently and notably, I'm sure you heard, is the closing of Sweetbriar College. Um, that was, I think, ca that came as a major surprise to many people, including the faculty and students of Sweetbriar. And I raise that as just one example. Back in 1990 and 1994, David Brennan um, did a study and then published a book where he asked, are we losing our liberal, our liberal arts colleges? And at that particular moment, based on the criteria he set, there were approximately 212 liberal arts colleges across the US. In 2012, three scholars went back, looked at his data, and redid the analysis. And they found at that time there were 130 institutions that Brennan had originally had identified a drop in, of 39% or so in terms of liberal arts colleges across the country. Now, there are many reasons for that, some of which are major public universities have incorporated liberal arts education more into their curriculum. But I think a 39% drop is something significant and does serve as a real barometer of the changes. Another symptom of this transition has to do with the attack on the humanities. Now, we see them all the time, especially those of us in liberal arts, and especially those in the humanities. Most recently, there was a comment by Pat McCrory, the governor of North Carolina, where it was stated about gender studies. That's a subsidized course. If you want to take gender studies, that's fine. Go to a private school and take it. But I don't want to subsidize that if it's not going to get someone a job. So it's one particular attack. 
Um, but this is not new. In fact, what I'm suggesting is that these symptoms began decades ago. In 1967, we hear Ronald Reagan making a similar claim in, when he was governor of California when he said, taxpayers shouldn't subsidize intellectual curiosity. Well, um, are we surprised? Um, no, we're not surprised that Reagan said this, but I do think it's indicative of a changing tread, trend and how people were perceiving education in general and liberal education in particular. Another, symptoms, another symptom that I see referred to in the quote by McCrory is a renewed pragmatism that equates education with a particular job or career or pathway to big bucks. Um, now, there are examples of this all over the place. We see this in the increase in professional schools and in professional education. We see it in the increase in technical fields, and I'll talk about this shortly. We see it in declining semester credit hours and majors in arts and humanities and even in some social sciences. So this is sort of one of the symptoms of something larger, I suggest. In particular, we see it in the rise of STEM education, both here and abroad. Uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2012-13 looked at a percentage of BAs that were granted across the country. And if you add STEM and business, it equated to 42% of all bachelor's degrees given in the United States. That same data shows that BAs and the core humanities, and here they define core humanities as the um, sort of traditional English literature philosophy fields. Um, it had fallen in 2012-13 percent, and it was the third straight year in a row that those percentages had fallen. As a percentage of all BAs, Bachelor's degrees fell 6.5 percent, fell to 6.5 percent in 2013 if you're looking at core disciplines. They also look at what they call CIP data, which is a bit more inclusive, that includes gender studies and area studies. But even there, the number of BAs as a percentage of all degrees given was only at 10 percent. You then have certain proposals, not to say that these have been funded that have emerged over the last few years, as in the state of Pennsylvania, where the State House put together a bill to actually subsidize STEM education so that it was cheaper for students to get a STEM-related degree. And you have folks, folks like Andreas Schleicher, if you don't know who I'm, um, Andreas Schleicher is a, is a policy wonk. He works for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has done a lot of work on looking at these kinds of issues. And he basically commented and said, everybody knows that STEM is the better investment. Government knows that. Parents know that. One example of this um, internationally is China had, has announced recently they will be um, investing $1.6 trillion over the next decade to support programs in biotechnology, alternative energy, and information technologies. Now, they're also invested in liberal education as well. But I think here what we see is the trends are up. Um, and so if anything, as I said, education is, trend, is in transition. I, I don't want to sound as an alarmist, but the trends are up and moving. Um, STEM numbers are increasing. Numbers in humanities fields, for the most part, have been decreasing. And we see similar results if you look at the Middle East and North Africa. And I won't spend a lot of time on this because that's not a real focus here, but just to give you a few examples. As, a, as an expenditure, um, why this, this region is important. As a public expenditure of the entire government budgets, the Middle East and North Africa is spending 19% of their budget on education. North America spends 14%, and the OECD average is at 14% as well. So the Middle East is investing millions and millions of dollars in higher education. 
Much of it is going into technical education. Now this is some data that is not the latest, but in Oman, for example, um, if you look at field of study, and this is data put together by the Ministry of Education and the World Bank, in 2008, literature, arts, and social science degrees were at 6%. STEM degrees were at 37%, and education at 40%. So the trends are moving in a particular direction here. Now, why am I concerned for STEM besides being a dean in the College of Liberal Arts, okay? Um, for one, the amount of funding going to STEM. The Obama administration, as you know, NSF, um, state incentives, for example, in California, um, California is, has a huge investment in STEM education, as well as private industry. Numerous you know, corporations are putting funding into STEM education. Hewlett Packard, Honda, others, okay? But also, the amount of funding going to STEM education at K-12, okay? So people are putting, corporations are putting, governments are putting a large amount of money into this particular field. Now, I should say, I should say especially for my science colleagues in the audience, um, I'm not against science, technology, engineering, or math. That's not the issue. What I am concerned about is I think a focus solely on STEM, and I know I'm biased, but I think it's, it's, it's only a partial education. It, it, deal, it doesn't deal with what I might call adaptive challenges society is facing. It deals with technical challenges society is facing. And by that, I mean open up the front page of the New York Times most days of the week. And sure, you're gonna have articles related to science, for sure, but it's really the intersection of science with society. The problems we are facing are not just, cannot be solved or addressed just through a science or technical education. We need people who know something about the world. Now, another part of my bias is I am concerned about the influence of external research money on the academy. And I know universities, UT in particular, has very strict rules on how money that's brought into the university relates to research. But in effect, as many of us know, uh, if we want to fund our research, we have to chase the research dollars. And where are those research dollars coming from? And what are the agendas being set? So that's, that's another concern of mine. So, my premise. My premise is that these symptoms that I've just been talking about are the result of a more fundamental cultural shift I want to refer to or I want to talk to as globalization. What do I mean by globalization? Um, you can read my definition. It's a set of practices, ideas, and economies that have led to the disruption and reformation of markets, technologies, and rituals that shape our behavior. Now, one very small example, but one that many people, when it first started happening, became very much aware of and began to study, is just the whole issue of transnational labor. Now, again, it's not that this is a new issue. I think what people are concerned with in globalization is the speed at which it's happening and the breadth at which it's taking place. So instead of isolated immigration that we've had in terms of historical immigration patterns, we're talking about real transnational national labor flows. And that's just one example. But in short, we're talking about a new dominant cultural logic. And it's this piece here that I actually want to spend some time with and that I am more deeply concerned about. And if you will allow me, I'm going to spend a little bit of time re reading through the following text, because I think it, um, it is helpful, at least for me, to make sure I get this um, and say it the way I want to. So the following comments stem from the general description um, of, and we can use many phrases here, many terms, but the general description of postmodernism by Frederick Jameson in his book, Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. And while this book was written early in what we have come to know as globalization, Jameson's discussion continues to lay both descriptive 
an analytical claim to my understanding of this phenomenon. Let me begin, however, by returning to my earlier definition of globalization and offer why, in describing its features, I invoke Jameson's notion of postmodernism. The two are not synonymous, but they are clearly intertwined. My definition of globalization describes what we might refer to as the effects of this cultural moment. That is, the reformation of markets, technologies, and labor, globalization, are themselves the effects of a particular view and engagement with the world. That view of the world is itself understood by articulating the culture underlying it. Whether we call it postmodernism, late capital, neoliberalism, it doesn't matter, I don't think. I'm interested in the experience that people are going through and the experience and values that shape particular people's particular actions. I use this approach to examine the features of education since, as an institution, it is, it is cut from the same cultural cloth as the wider society. Education generally, and liberal education specifically, wanes and flows in the cultural milieu of the larger social order as both a product and producer of various forces and ideas related to this cultural moment. Although, as you certainly know, as an institution, education is somewhat unique. It is where we see a set of practices aligned more broadly along a continuum of what Raymond Williams refers to as emergent and residual forms. That is, one of the reasons, or, and I suggest that one of the reasons there is so much attention paid to, higher, to reforming higher education, the tenure system, and other features unique to university life, right, is that the ideologues of globalization see its presence as a stark reminder as an institution out of alignment with this dominant cultural logic. In this presentation, I want to focus more specifically on the relationship between education and the cultural logic of globalization. But first, let me sketch some general features of this broader culture. The first feature I want to refer to, and these are general descriptions that Jameson, artic Jameson articulates, and I'm going to shape them into my own interpretation, is depthlessness. By this, I refer to a receding of social engagement, where sociality skates across the surface of our interactions, landing everywhere but in no place in particular for a long time. In other words, there is a loss of long-term rooted experiences that shape human consciousness. This was first commented on more broadly in the changing dynamics of labor. Long-term employment for workers, blue and white collar alike, spend most of their careers with, the one, with one employer as the thing of the past, as we well know. Yes, there are exceptions, but it's no longer the norm. Its analog, I offer, is found in social media. Even the term social media reflects a kind of fluidity not found in earlier forms of sociality. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of which I have, um, and other social exchange forms serve as the new normal by which many interact, digitally, publicly, laying bare portraits of themselves once revealed to only a sector of their social network. The common thread here is social movement instead of long-term placement, and a preponderance for surface-level interactions instead of deep social engagements. Related to this is what Jameson refers to as the disappearance of the individual subject or the waning of personal feeling and style. Two ways of thinking about this. The first I first read about um, in a book that I found quite influential, at least to me personally, uh, and that was Susan Cain's book, Quiet. In here, she talks about the culture of character versus the culture of personality. And this is something she got, gets from Warren Sussman in his work. Now, she refers to the culture of character, and her example here is Abraham Lincoln, who by all accounts considered himself a shy and reserved person, but through his character was able to um, practice, demonstrate, and exhibit great moral strength in the times that he faced. That compared to what has, Susan Cain talks about has emerged more recently as the culture of personality. 
So these two things, cultural personality, where it is one's sort of, again, one's outgoing, outgoingness, one's sense of presentness uh, to the outside world, is what is seen now as being more important in terms of leadership. So culture of personality seems counterintuitive to the waning of personal feeling and style. And that's, yet, that's exactly what it is. Personal feeling and style references just those qualities that are tied to individual character, while the culture of personality is all about surface representations and public image. Second, in the digital age, personal attributes and contributions, besides being mediated through public forms such as social media, are mitigated and monitored through external pressures that influence conformity. Thus, the individual disappears into a collective morass of others. The most visual image I have here is my own LinkedIn page, um, as well as those of all my contacts. I have to admit, I open LinkedIn and see pictures upon pictures of contacts, some of whom I barely know. And then when I look at them, and I see that little icon that says, 500 plus connections, I'm a little astounded and ask, who can really know this many people? Where is the personal all this? And I was deeply chagrined when I realized I had over 400. Uh, <laughs> but the point is, I don't know who these 400 people are. So here, the more connections one has, the more publicly one is recognized, the higher their status. So the next two features Jameson refers to that I want to talk about are presentness and the crisis in historicity. By presentness, I am rephrasing Jameson when he speaks about the collapsing of past and future into a perpetual, perpetual present. And the crisis in historicity refers to the receding value of historical understanding and valuing this understanding. In the notion of presentness, we see Jameson trying to understand in the early 90s something that is today much more common, the immediacy of the present, the onslaught of, the onslaught of media networks and 24-hour 24, 24 instantaneous availability of almost anything on the net, influences our need for information and, experiences, and to experience everything in the present moment. I remember, and I know not, some of you will remember this, some of you weren't even born yet. Um, but I remember in 1980 when CNN began. And I, f I heard about this 24-hour news network, and I thought, is it going to make it? Do people really want to watch news 24 hours a day? And yet, we not, as you know, CNN, MTV, all, you know, the plethora of networks that are 24 hours because people need their information now. Relatedly, there are many examples of our failure to understand or appreciate the past. In particular, many see the past as empty signifiers to be refilled with the content of their immediate ideological concerns. A key example is in the invocation of political actors. And here I go back to Ronald Reagan again. Um, and the invocation of these political figures for political gain. These reformations fail to understand the historical uniqueness of these figures, distorting their genuine contributions. I'm reminded here of how particular political figures will call on Ronald Reagan as their source of inspiration. And yet, you know, by today's standards, he would be a liberal, perhaps, if not at least a much more centered conservative. So invocations like this are themselves symptomatic of a surface reading of history that fails to explore in depth the various semantic horizons that allow genuine historical understanding to illuminate. Here, I am not suggesting such discourses are new, only that they embody the dominant form of historical rhetoric in the public sphere. One last comment that I'll read to you. My descriptions here are filled with terms like waning and receding, words that invoke a deep sense of loss. Lest you think these are the romantic grumblings of an old man, which I am, but these are not. Um, feeling nostalgic for an earlier historic moment, that's not what I'm doing. I suggest that such language is indicative of a larger social process of dissolution and reformulation experienced at the level of the personal. As such, sentiments of loss serve an indexical function that signal not only personal, but social 
if not structural change as well. Bringing such sentiments to the fore and in allow us to rethink the personal through their deep connections and embeddedness in the structural forces of the moment. If left at the level of the personal, our experience remains largely disconnected and untheorized from the larger social arena that we inhabit. So that's my sort of analytical introduction into the effects of globalization on the academy. In effect, I see these features sort of, we are part of them, so we are dealing with them as well. So what are some of the ways we see these elements working on the academy? The first I'd like to say is the rise of interdisciplinary studies. And I say this as one who is front and center pushing this particular agenda. Um, my, my comments here are not meant to be uh, focusing on see things as, as sort of negative, but as, a, as a, these are responses I, as I take them. Um, and the rise of interdisciplinary studies that value smaller segments of knowledge from a broad range of disciplines, in some cases, or in their worst cases, um, without a depth, a depth of understanding in core areas. Um, so we see this again beginning back in the 60s and 70s. You see it with the rise of ethnic studies. And again, I'm not making a critique of them. In fact, I want to come back to them in a few minutes. Women's studies on this campus, international relations and global studies, or other forms of area studies. Related to their emergence is also the loss of master narratives and master theory. Now, these master narratives were not necessarily better, but they did have a unifying effect on the academy. Um, but as you know, and I need to make this clear, they had this unifying effect by actually excluding things like women's studies and ethnic studies. So there was a dynamic there that we need to be, be very mindful of. Still, they are one of the ways in which the academy has been affected by this, um, if, this notion of globalization that I'm pointing to. At the same time, there are increased specializations in core disciplines. Um, my concern is that an increased special, specialization in core disciplines can, can dilute what we might want to call traditional knowledge frames. One brief example, and I'm not picking on anyone in particular, except I am using an example from government, since we just had a meeting with their department. Um, in their documents that we read, the CLASP documents, for those of you who know these, they talk about seven subfields. Political philosophy, American politics, public law, international relations, methods and formal theory, public policy, and comparative politics, all within one department. My own department had five subfields, now has four. But even there, we are divided into other areas. So what I'm pointing, here, pointing to here is that in some ways our curriculum has moved in a way that's almost too broad, but in some ways it's also moved and constructed too narrowly. More importantly, I see a continued dissolution of arts and sciences education, where the value of the other is diminished. And we usually see this in the name of specialization. And I'll come back to some of this in a, in a few minutes. Something we all know very well here is the increase in requirements. OK. Um, UT has a 42-hour mandated state core. We have university general ed requirements that, for the most part, overlay that, but not always. We have college requirements that you can blame me for. We have major requirements. We have flag requirements. And we will soon have transcript recognized minor requirements. Okay. Interestingly, if you begin to look at those, the state core, university requirements, flags, college requirements are all about breath. The major is the only thing we have left that is actually trying to deal with depth. We also see an increased demand for specific credentials. In fact, the whole rise of the transcript recognized minors came out of this. Um, and if you know, undergraduates want credit for everything they do, right? 
whether it's working at HEB or interning someplace for the, at the Capitol. Um, the rise of credits and microcredits and badges, we don't have that yet here, but some institutions do. There is an increase in requirements that suggest that we need to objectify our understanding with these particular credentials. Increased emphasis on data analytics. Need I point to SACS and no further? Um, the amount of data analytics that we are asked to look at and collect and the amount of time that we're asked to spend on these. Okay. Um, my concern is not with data in particular. Um, it's, it's my concern with large data at the expense of more qualitative, nuanced information, especially when we're looking at teaching and learning. It's really hard to quantify that with any kind of subjective data. So, and one I know you're very, very familiar with this, familiar with is the corporati corporatization of the academy. In effect, any of these things up here, we can spend you know, whole days discussing and analyzing. But in terms of the corporatization of the academy, we can look at for-profit universities, MOOCs that have turned some professors into commodities. Um, those of you who were here a few years back, remember the seven-step solutions that was being proffered by folks, um, certain regents uh, on our board. In particular, the way in which they were discussing faculty merit pay based on student evaluations and their whole discourse of the student as customer. Um, the rise of pragmatism that I spoke about earlier and the rise of what Marilyn Strathern refers to as audit culture, the increasing role of review, assessment, and risk-averse practices in the academy. You know, those of you who travel internationally, if you're doing IRB approvals, grant regulations, and now contracts, okay? The kind of scrutiny that is going into all of these features, okay? So what's the overall effect of this? What does this tell us about the state of education today? I think we see the effects of globalization in the waning of depth in our curriculum, an increase in broad learning that skates across the surface of intellectual understanding, an increase in quantifying knowledge, be it through transcript recognized minors or data analytics that objectify in unqualified terms knowledge acquisition, the valuation of economic measures, be they the value of a degree, faculty teaching, and profit incentives. So, if a liberal education, at least in my understanding, a unified arts and sciences education is, is at its core holistic, is it surprising that society at large misunderstands the worth and potential of what this education is about? Is it any surprise that students don't understand how and why studying philosophy and language and science and culture in unison will benefit them. We're working, we're working against the cultural logic of our time. And I think this is something that we need to spend a lot of time thinking about and analyzing. But I'm equally concerned with the effects of globalization inside the academy and how it has led to this dissolution of an arts and sciences education. I believe that arts and STEM fields, whether it's humanities, social sciences, other kinds of arts education, no longer know how to engage each other. Um, the inability of us to be able to talk across these disciplines. And I'd um, like to read um, a quote. There is a, a document that the American Academy of Arts and Sciences put out um, in 2013 called The Heart of the Matter. It says that the very moment when China and some European nations are seeking to replicate our model of broad education in the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences, we are instead narrowing our focus and abandoning our sense of what education has been and should continue to be. And I suggest this narrowing has led to a lack of a unified understanding of knowledge. There's been a breakdown in what I think of as holistic thinking. Um, now, if this is going on the academy, how have we, meaning the academy, 
try to deal with this? What, what, have, our, what have been our responses to this? Well, I think we, we've, we've responded to these issues in various ways. One is internships. Whether you are in the arts or the sciences, internships are trying to make connections to something outside the academy, and I'll come back to that in a second. The second are capstone, integrating academic experiences um, that are not visible in the curriculum. Study abroad, providing international connecting experience. Undergraduate research, advancing exploration for certain kinds of students, and service learning, um, connecting to the, cl the classroom, to the community. But the question is why? Why are we doing this? Why, do we, why are these strategies even in place? I see these as strategy, strategies of restoration or augmentation. What do I mean by that? Internships are restoring a certain relevance that I believe the curriculum has lost. Capstones, restoring an integrative experience because the curriculum is too broadly dispersed. Study abroad, trying to make those connecting experiences to real history and culture. Undergraduate research, restoring deep exploration into the curriculum. And service learning, developing a framework for empathy, dialogue, and leadership that is lacking in the curriculum. Another set of strategies are what I refer to as hybrid strategies. Whether we're talking, people refer to STEM plus or STEAM, where you add arts to STEM. Um, the growing number of joint degrees and the way in which business foundations and the role it's played here for many students, in particular on the side of liberal arts. Now, how do we move, what's my, how do we move forward? What am I, I'm not only going to give you a critique, I want to suggest three paths forward. One is we need to continue the restorative strategies. I'm going to come back and articulate these further, in particular the second and third, the second and third one. A theoretical and practical revisioning of knowledge production and a reorganization of the academy. This is where chairs don't get too excited, although some of you might, who knows. Uh, so, Continue restorative strategies. We can't stop doing these things. Okay, these are critical. Um, I do think they're important. Um, I do think they allow our students to engage and deal with issues in a very productive way. But again, I ask the question: Why are they there in the begin? Begin? Why are they there in the first place? Um, so we cannot do away with those, and we must continue them, if not strengthen them. Theoretical and practical revisioning of knowledge production. We already have departments, but we need more flexibility. More fixed flexibility, flexibility in developing new models of knowledge. How? By creating an intellectual community across humanities, social sciences, sciences. Now, this is happening in some places. In fact, what got me thinking along these lines is talking to many of you and asking you, who are your interlocutors for your work? And a number of faculty I asked that question to point to faculty outside their department. Okay. Um, I find that is interesting. You know, our, our primary, uh, primary folks we engage with to do our research are not in our department. What is, why? So how do we then, how, how then do we use that and try to create something different? Another example, um, I think, thanks Tony for drawing my attention to this, is an NSF program called IGERT, Integrative Graduate Education and Research Traineeship, um, where they're actually putting money in doing this kind of thing at the graduate level. Um, another example, although it's, it's not to totally, doesn't sort of fill all the way through some of the ideas I have, um, regardless what we may think, but the new African and African Diaspora Studies program is actually an interesting model. Uh, why? Because it's faculty from multiple disciplines engaging each other. I don't think they go far enough, but that's actually something along the lines of what I'm thinking. What's critical is that sciences need to be included. They're not right now, at least in the ads model. 
Um, and I think we can go further with that. So we need to work towards a commitment um, of the dialogic emergence of understanding and knowledge. Clusters create a common, and I want to under underscore this, a common, not a singular or totalizing method of exploring the world. We also need to develop a common language. Um, I was talking to Elizabeth Keating, who's here, um, yesterday afternoon, and she was telling me of a particular research, research group she's part of, where you had scientists and humanists and social sciences, and they actually could not carry on an academic dialogue. They did not know how to engage each other. Okay. I think this dissolution has created these kinds of barriers that we no longer know how to talk across those disciplinary lines. And producing a, a multi-dimensional yet unified methodology born from the real work that goes on in these academic research units, whether we call them clusters or whatever. With cross-disciplinary intellectual communities, we began to develop a shared method of knowledge production. But the method has to emerge from the work itself. It can't be theoretical or hypothetical. Again, from that document, um, the heart of the matter that the American Academy put out, they're talking about undergraduate education here, but they make the following claim. Interdisciplinary research centers, which often stand at the crossroads of the arts and sciences, offer opportunities for undergraduates to take direct role in exploration and to bring the parts of their study into a coherent whole. I think that's what we're missing, and that's what we need to be look, looking at, and that's what I want to point to. So the presence of these communities, these clusters, whatever we call them, doesn't assure success, but puts in place conditions of possibility for the reorganization of knowledge formation by creating conditions for holistic academic work, including the theorizing around that work itself reorganization of the academy. I actually think the academy needs to, in terms of its organization, needs to follow the flow of the work being done. So the first step is alternative organizational structures. Um, alternatives to departments, not necessarily in place of them, um, that have the flexibility and by these alternative structures, I mean alternative structures that have real FTEs attached to them. So whether they are research units, research clusters, or multidisciplinary across these fields, departments, um, places where academics can do their work and that tenure homes are located. Um, allow these new units to organize around problem-based, thematic, interdisciplinary issues or questions. I take theoretical questions as also being real problems. I'm not suggesting these have to be dealing with sort of real world issues, because I actually take, think theoretical work is actually real, work is, real world issue. But one example might be the study of immigration. What would a, the product of a research group that looked at the issue of immigration, if it had people from public policy, people from international law, people from health, People who looked at security, culture, psychology, the influence and the effects on family, literary and expressive cultural forms related to this experience. How does this give us a sense of a different picture of what this issue is about? And then I would let the way in which this kind of work emerges shape the internal organization of the academy. And I would actually reform the undergraduate curriculum around these kinds of initiatives. You build a curriculum based on how the work is being done. Um, again, in the heart of the matter, they claim, we're not arguing for a return to the general education of some idealized past. Argu arguing over what things students should know and what mental skills they need to develop are worthy projects. And the curriculum that emerges from this debate will allow plenty of room for creativity, both in the design and its, and its delivery. The key is defining a vision of education that meets students' needs broadly, as broadly capable people, equipped for the lives that await them, not one that simply mirrors the map of our current faculty specializations. 
And so my sense is that if we can research and we can organize ourselves differently, we will present a multifaceted mirror to our students and provide a very, well, hopefully, a, a different and more holistic education that then has various and stronger connections to their world outside after they leave here. Now, I think this has to be done dialogically. It can't be done by anyone from the top down. Um, and I'm not, I don't have a particular model in place, but I will recommend just sort of thinking through this very roughly. And again, I haven't spent much time on what a model might look like, because I don't think it's up to me to develop a model. That's up to a group like this or others to do it. But a model might look like for undergraduates, where they spend the first two years studying core disciplines and, method and get methodological training. They spend a third year working with faculty and working groups and research clusters, and include in that field work, internships, service learning, related to the work that they're doing, the problems that they're addressing. And the fourth year of related work, where they're actually producing something, whether it's a thesis, a paper, or a project, that integrates their work with the work of the faculty. Now, in conclusion, examining the effects of globalization on the academy allows me to explore and understand the forces we face at this historical juncture. Over the last 50 to 60 years, we have experienced various challenges to the core mission of higher education. The symptoms outlined at the beginning of this presentation are causing many to question the value and benefits of a college education. You can only think of Scott Walker, you know, governor of, of Wisconsin. So they're questioning the benefits of college education and liberal education in particular. At this point, it is important to remember how higher education has weathered previous challenges. It's done so with measured, thoughtful, and analytically reasoned responses. I'm suggesting no less. I don't assume to have all the answers on these issues, but I do know that running from change is not the answer. Collectively and in dialogue, we must find ways to assure that the principles, values, and content of a liberal, edu of a liberal education continue to shape the students of the 21st century. My remarks today represent one direction I believe this dialogue could take. Thank you. So I think we have some time for questions, especially if it's still raining out there. Yes. Thank you, Richard, for an extremely interesting and thoughtful presentation. I am really struck by the combination of big problems that you identified, the depthlessness, the focus on personality rather than character, somehow the way our curriculum has depth without holism and specialization without, um, sorry, breadth without holism and specialization without real depth. And I'm wondering if there's another piece of what we need to be doing to address this in addition to all the ways of integrating learning and sending students out into the real world and sending students abroad that isn't really important, which would have to do with trying to restore the holism at the deepest level in terms of engaging students with big questions in a really sustained way. And I wonder what you think about how we, if you, if you agree that that's also missing and, and how we could restore that or do it differently and better than we have in the past. I do agree it's missing. Um, as you know, the challenges we at an institution like this face are just sheer size, right? and resources. Um, if we could um, have smaller classes and do this in a more concerted way, yes, that would answer a lot of problems. The challenge is how do we do that at, in, at an institution like this? Um, again, I don't have an answer for that. I think well, one response might be, um, at least in the College of Liberal Arts, if we had fewer requirements that moved us across the plane laterally and allowed us to develop more depth, it would help. Uh, 
It's not a solution, but it would help. Uh, but I think we are challenged at an institution like this to find a way, but that doesn't mean we can't, okay? Yes, Bob. Richard, I know this is a concern of all of us in liberal arts, all the things you talked about. I'm wondering whether you have found sympathetic ears in natural sciences and computer sciences and communication and fine arts even, I mean, which is certainly a loss to us, just the distance right. between the two colleges. Whether, in other words, uh, you think this is a general feeling um, or something that because we do liberal arts, we're feeling uh, in particularly uh, the loss. I can't answer specifically for the natural sciences. David is here from the College of Natural Sciences, and I won't try to speak for him or put him on the spot. I have talked to several in natural sciences who I think would share a similar sentiment. Um, in some way, I see their Bachelor of Science in Arts as a way of trying to think this through, okay? Um, and, but, you know, from my perspective, it, it's, it's an attempt to think it through, but without engaging, really, the, the sort of the thought leaders on the liberal arts side and how we can do this together. Um, so I think that was an attempt to do something that allowed natural science majors to get this kind of training. And I, you know, that was, that's my take on it. Um, I haven't had that many discussions with them. Um, I, I sort of formalized these ideas. These ideas have been percolating for a while, um, but I formalized them in the last three months, and so I'll have a chance now to see what they think. The two of them are here with Cameron. Thanks, Richard. So at some level, one understands the market forces and the issue of, especially if you're paying so much for your children's education, then they should come out in the job market on that, and that you link with globalization or cultural logic. Or, but, and then the move, of course, you're not saying that Bantu languages should not be taught or may should not be taught even, right? You know, right. And that is a core of humanities or, or our, but the move towards this in a kind of interdisciplinarity in the sense of immigration, it's, it's kind of a pragmatic move or urbanization, like where a cluster of different disciplines come together. Now, with the kind of, very particularly, for instance, if I take our, our university and one goes to that model, which I want to understand, but that's also a move of a certain kind of a demand, right? That the education should be meaningful in terms of its, uh, what is the presentism, right? I mean, these are the social issues of our time and it can be different 50 years from now or it may have been different previously. But in terms of resource distribution, then what happens to core disciplines and those departments? In the sense of we have a small pot, which then these new clusters, I'm speaking hypothetically as you right. we have a department of immigration or a department of urbanization, urban issues or department of uh, studying social media or communication. But then, of course, there will be a tension between English and sociology or linguistics and these spaces where they will have their own interests. I'm just wondering, uh, I, I understand and I'm sort of sympathetic to what you're saying, but I'm saying that how does one, I mean, I'm just saying that the market logic is far deeper and more problematic than the kinds of ways that we, and I think what you're suggesting is we need to really sit together and think through this, but. That, but I don't, I'm not suggesting that these core areas are disappearing in any sense. But they will take money or uh, resources away from Under Understood, I know what you're saying. But, what I, I, but first of all, I'm, I'm suggesting that these core disciplines themselves need to be integrated with these larger issues, okay? Or these larger research efforts and initiatives. But the friction you're talking about we see now, um, and I've, you've heard me say this before, and many of you have said it to me, the number of departments that blame for international relations and global studies for losing their majors, right? Here's an interdisciplinary major. You know, our majors have dropped 30%. It's because they're all going to IRG, okay? That friction exists now. Um, so what are we going to do about it? Are we going to let it continue in any kind of unthoughtful way? Or are we going to really take the time to think through this and see how do we want to move both in core disciplines and with these interdisciplinary efforts to make sure that we are maintaining the values that we, that we have and that we espouse, 
but change in a way that is productive for our students and for our faculty. It's not easy. If it does, I'd, I'd have an answer for you, right? Doug. The model of IRG is a little bit better, the opposite of what you're, I understood you to articulate. That is to say, I understood it that it was more research oriented from the point of view of the faculty first. And you get a cluster of people who are interested across campus in different kinds of initiatives. I mean, I've been talking to various people about different things from anthropology to, uh, well, that's not too far across campus. It's just the other side of the, you know. But anyway. Um, Upstairs. Yeah, well, I'm all the way over there. It's pretty far. But um, you understand it's, it's, it's faculty driven in terms of a research agenda from people from different departments right. and things that then develops into some area that they're working together on that would be appropriate for undergraduate research. What happened with IRG instead was there was a major created, as I understand it, that was not really created out of a faculty investment and collaborative effort. And so I think most faculty feel probably that they're at the service of something, IRG. Whether or not it's taking away majors is really immaterial to me, as opposed to everything flows from faculty research. It seems to me at a research institute, everything should flow from research-oriented projects. The kinds of areas that we want our students to be investigating, the kinds of things that are invested. The problem that, that that um, that Kamran articulated is in, in, you described having FTEs in these areas, and that becomes, I think, part of that market logic problem. That is to say, sure. well, FTEs in any area today is a problem, right? Well, for us, the fact that we have too many of them, according to the, the, the college. But I, what I'm saying is, you then start thinking about these research clusters, and you want FTEs in those research clusters, is they're typically grounded in departments. That's the function of departments as opposed to interdisciplinary studies. I understand that some area studies right, have right. FTEs in them, but that's the problem because you started thinking we're going to take people from history, psychology, anthropology, math, put them together, we'll have a research cluster because they're invested in, but then at some point hire an FTE in that cluster area, but typically you house them in those... In effect, we've done it, okay? When I was hired here back in 97, I had 50% of my appointment in the Center for Mexican American Studies. Right. Okay. Um, LILAS, even though they're not a tenure home, right. has 50% appointments right. in terms of teaching and service. Now, FTEs can be a depart in, in units like these research clusters, or they can be departments understanding that 100% of their time is going to be spent over here. Right. Again, I, I'm pointing, these are, these are particular kinds of ways of addressing this, they're not the only way. I was just thinking there are models out there. I mean, right. there are two questions. There are models such as at Brown where they have something called a university professor. That professor can range from any department to department and teaching any different kind of courses. That's one model. The other thing I was questioning was you travel a lot. And I'm kind of curious about as new universities are being created in all kinds of places, are they replicating the kinds of things that you find are inefficient and non-productive here, or are they creating, is NYU in Singapore, Yale and whatever, are they trying out new things and trying out something they can build something from scratch? They don't have to do it the old way. And so I'm just kind of curious, that's a model whereby something can be built. Um, and so I'm just, what, what your experience is in terms of <coughs> witnessing new universities being created all the time? Many of the universities I've seen primarily in the Middle East are based on either a European model or so the replicating US model, our errors. except for in many cases tenure. That's the one thing that is many times on the table. It's not being done. Now, it is for faculty who move from, say, NYU to go teach in Abu Dhabi, but for local folks, it's, it's not always the option. But the disciplinary breakdowns is the same. In many ways. Okay. Other questions, comments? Reactions. I have my umbrella in case you want to throw tomatoes. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming. Oh, wait. Okay, one last question, then we'll end. Um, I have a, maybe a broader question. I'm not faculty, so please forgive me if this is short sighted somehow. Um, but if I understand 
the structure of what you're suggesting is that this process of globalization has impacted uh, academics and culture generally, and then by virtue of that, academics. And so you're suggesting a response to this to try to restore what we once lost in the context of this new sort of global market. I'm curious if underlying all this is some kind of rejection of globalization broadly, or if it's just a trying to uh, adapt to this new sort of scheme. And maybe that aim is too short of sight. I think what I'm suggesting is change is necessary. Um, change always happens, okay? But if we don't see how we can, and I don't know what word to use, adapt, change, deal with the current historical moment um, in a way that takes front and center the things we value, um, that change is gonna happen to us. Um, in some sense, we see that already. Uh, the closing of liberal arts colleges is one, just one example. And so can we start a process of dialogue, thinking, study that allows us to see where do we want to go? You know, the university of the 21st century, there is no particular reason it needs to mirror the university of the 20th century. Okay. So what is important to us as faculty, as an institution? How do we maintain those principles and the content of our knowledge and bring it forward in a way that actually deals with issues that are important today? Ward, I said one last question, but this will be it. What troubles me about the whole um, uh, development in education these days is that it, the emphasis always is on uh, positive knowledge, which is easily testable, easily communicable, and doesn't develop uh, critical thinking skills. I know that at the highest level, uh, science uh, fields, mathematics, and so on, get to the need for original thinking, the very imaginative stuff and so on. But there's an enormous body of material that uh, people know how science is, people know math, people have to get to. And certainly overseas, I've seen in places like Singapore, is that that's the entire focus. And I don't know how we maintain our commitment to critical thinking, you know, it sounds cliche as soon as anybody, any of us, start talking about this. But how do we maintain a, that element to what we think education is in the face of the onslaught, which is positive? I, I agree. Uh, one brief vignette that speaks to that. I was in a country in the Middle East I will not name, and people at this university were talking about all the technical skills their students learn. They said, but they also need to learn soft skills. Now, I had never heard that term before, okay? <laughs> Call me ignorant, but I had never heard it. So I asked, what are soft skills? And they talked about critical thinking, effective communication, um, good writing, all the things we say uh, an, arts and an arts and science education should develop. But being the anthropologist I am and being sensitive to the nuances of culture, I didn't call those liberal arts skills or anything. I said, you know what, those are leadership skills. Those aren't soft skills. And the person said, yes, but we only have one leader here. We can't talk about creating more leaders. <laughs> um, so yes, I agree with you. In some ways, what they're doing is safer in many ways. Um, I gave a version of this, not quite the same, in Saudi Arabia. And afterwards, someone came out to me and said, you know, you're right, except when we teach, we have all these red lines that we can't cross. But if we look at what has made American higher education great. This is what it's been, okay? So it's how do we preserve that and move it forward in the face of the kind of focus on technical skills only, I think, that many parts of Asia in the Middle East are invested in. So thank you for coming. We still have time to hang around and enjoy refreshments. <laughs>